majestic, dramatic, or inspiring. These are the bridges that are worldwide icons, as well as engineering marvels. She's beautiful. Each of them broke new ground. The first, the biggest, the longest, and the tallest. I'm Rob Bell, an engineer. And I'm on a global adventure to discover how and why these magnificent structures were built and to learn about the sweat and the sacrifice that went into their construction. Well, hey! I'm going to take you closer than ever before. Oh, this is magnificent. Inspect them from every conceivable angle. Oh, yeah and meet the men and women who keep them working round the clock, no matter what. Check this out. These are the world's greatest bridges. Across the world, metal bridges dominate the landscape. These iconic structures come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Many attract thousands of sightseers from across the globe. But one bridge came before them all, and it's located in a small village in Shropshire. This isn't the world's longest bridge. It's not the world's highest either, and the techniques used to build it weren't revolutionary. But it's quite possibly the most important bridge ever made, because it was the very first in the world to be made entirely from iron. A massive 378 tonnes of it. The Iron Bridge stretches almost 200 feet across Britain's longest river, the Severn. When it opened on New Year's Day 1781, it grabbed the attention of the entire world. Nothing like it had ever been built before. Hundreds of people made the crossing on that very first day. And these are the charges for crossing from one side to the other. A horse and cart would cost you threepence. An ox or a cow, you'd have to pay a penny. Even those traveling on foot still had to pay a halfpenny to get across. The Iron Bridge changed bridge building and engineering forever. It was immediately regarded as a wonder of the world, and it confirmed this spot as the cradle of the Industrial Revolution. It may be a sleepy rural valley today, but back in the 18th and 19th centuries, Coldbrookdale was a bustling industrial heartland, alive with factories and furnaces. Coming down into the valley was described as being like descending into hell. And that's because this whole area was rich in two of the raw, vital ingredients needed to power a revolution, coal and iron. The fourth most plentiful element, iron, makes up around 5% of the Earth's crust. Now, we've been using it for over 5,000 years to make everything from decorative jewelry to tools and weapons. But in order to do that, you first need to extract it from this, hematite. Heat it in a furnace to around 1100 degrees centigrade, and something magical happens. The rock melts away, leaving behind raw, hot, glowing iron. Once extracted from the ore, it takes a mix of real skill and brute force to turn it into anything useful. For centuries, the most common form of iron used was wrought iron. That's iron that's been worked and hammered into shape. But it's so difficult and requires so much skill to work with, blacksmiths were often regarded with an almost supernatural reverence. Even making small items was labor-intensive and expensive. But in 1491, an invention arrived from the continent the blast furnace. Bellows blasted air into the furnace, enabling it to reach much higher temperatures, in excess of 1,538 degrees centigrade. 
the temperature at which iron becomes liquid. The blast furnace allowed the creation of a new type of iron, cast iron. Now, the great thing about cast iron is you don't have to bang it into shape. You simply pour it into your moulds, like these ones here, and then let it solidify into, well, into pretty much any shape you want. The moulds are formed from sand, but this isn't ordinary sand. It's treated with a resin that sets at room temperature. In a minute or so, you'd feel it start going off. So that's going to go solid now? That's going to go hard, yeah. And that's creating the mould. So if you get a handful like that, it won't hurt your hand, but if you squeeze it very hard, oh, yeah, and, yeah. and then a couple of minutes of holding it, it'll be hard. That's gone rock solid now. That is, that's unbelievable. That's not your normal sand off the beach. With the moulds ready, it's time to pour the white-hot liquid iron. We're going to this first one? Yeah. Up there, up there, up there. Are you okay? Yep, good, thank you. It's pretty smooth now. Even though it looks like we're just pouring a liquid, this is uh, molten iron we're pouring here, and it is heavy. And the heat coming off of it is phenomenal. Just watching it go in is mesmerizing. Oh, look at that. What starts off as something liquid and almost fragile, in just a few minutes, it's going to turn into something that's, that's solid and strong and really quite beautiful and intricate. Come on, out you go. Let's flip that over. Oh, if I can. Look at that. Look at what we've produced here. <laughs> This new so-called cast iron not only made the job of iron workers easier, critically, it was cheaper to produce. But when the idea of building something as big as a bridge out of cast iron was put forward, it was so radical that potential investors in the project took fright. The world's first metal bridge very nearly didn't happen. The Iron Bridge, spanning the River Severn, is the very first bridge in the world to be built entirely out of iron. A marvel of early industrial engineering, it's the forerunner to every other metal bridge built in the past 235 years. But at the beginning of the 18th century, building something on this scale would have seemed beyond wildest dreams because iron could only be produced in very small quantities. But in 1709, an ironworks opened in Colebrookdale. The owner was Abraham Darby I, and he would revolutionize iron production. Now, we don't really know what Darby looked like, because as a Quaker, he'd never had his portrait painted. But we do know he was a very skilled metal worker. He started off making cooking pots out of brass, which were very cheap to produce. But in an effort to make them cheaper still, he invented a new method of casting very thin pots, but this time not out of brass, out of iron. Up till then, Iron had been cast in furnaces that used charcoal. Darby began the search for a different, lower cost fuel. The new fuel Darby came up with was this stuff here. It's called coke, made from baked coal. And not only was it cheaper than charcoal here, it had another major advantage, which I'll show you just now. Now, charcoal here has a low crushing strength. So when you put too much weight or force down onto it, it disintegrates into a fine powder. That fine powder there just breaks up. 
Now, in the furnaces, this powder gradually builds up and it blocks the airways, which reduces the temperature. That's not what you want. But with Coke, you don't get that problem. Watch this. Instead of that fine powder, it just breaks into chunks. This characteristic meant you could pile a greater weight of iron on top of it in the furnaces. In searching for a cheaper fuel, Darby had stumbled on something revolutionary. He'd found one that could power bigger furnaces. Bigger furnaces could smelt more iron, and that iron could be poured into bigger molds. This was a catalyst for the Industrial Revolution. By the mid-1700s, Darby's innovations had made the Severn Gorge the beating heart of industrial Britain. Thanks to the Severn, its forges and factories had easy access to important trading towns like Bristol and Shrewsbury. But the river also presented those industries with a problem. You can see it here in this painting by William Williams in 1776. Two thriving industrial communities Coalbrookdale and Brosley, bisected by the river. The only means of transporting materials from one community to the other was either by barge or a long road journey of several miles via the medieval bridge upriver at Buildwas. The gorge needed a new bridge. In 1776, the Shrewsbury architect Thomas Farnells Pritchard successfully petitioned Parliament to build one. Now, Pritchard was an ambitious man and keen to build his reputation. So whilst he could have built it out of stone or timber, he had a different idea, to build it out of metal. Pritchard approached Darby's grandson, Abraham Darby III, who'd inherited the Colbrookdale Ironworks at the tender age of just 13. The idea of an iron bridge greatly appealed to Darby. It would act as this fantastic and permanent advertisement for his company. After agreeing the plans, the two men met potential investors in a pub near to the site of the proposed bridge. They'd submitted a design and a budget of £3,200. But their project hit trouble from the off. Although the Act of Parliament gave permission to build a bridge, it didn't specify the building material. And Pritchard's idea to build it entirely out of cast iron was so radical, the investors started to get cold feet. As they threatened to pull out and as Pritchard stubbornly stuck to his original design plan, the entire project became deadlocked. 1776 became 1777, and it seemed the world's first iron bridge might never get built. Here in the Shropshire archives is a book that shows how close those investors came to pulling out. They've obviously changed their minds, and this is talking about that they're going to put an advertisement in the Shrewsbury and Birmingham newspapers to undertake the stone and brick work of a bridge. So no longer any mention of iron whatsoever? No, no, no. It says it was agreed to rescind the minutes with, with Mr Darby for erecting an iron bridge over the Severn between right. Bentall and May. And actually rescinding what had already been agreed. Mm. Yeah. Where are we now here? What, where's this dated? So this is July 1777. So this is a well, a good couple of years yes, since the first right. entry where yeah. this all came to head. Absolutely. So they've obviously had a lot of debate about it, um, but then it does confirm that it was agreed by Mr Abraham Darby to erect an iron bridge. So we're back to iron again. Mm. I mean, I think it's interesting if we look further on that he's actually sort of personally guaranteeing the cost of it in that if, if they aren't able to build the bridge by the date that they've decided, he says he will pay a sort of 5% penalty. Well, I guess that goes to show the confidence of, of Derby, doesn't it, in his, his material, the cast iron, that he will personally put his finances on the line should it, well, should anything go wrong, should the, uh, the construction go over. The dispute had held up construction for over 18 months, but with Derby agreeing to personally take on any financial overspend, 
work could finally get underway. Then, just one month into the build, tragedy struck. On December the 21st, Thomas Farnells Pritchard, the man whose dream it was to build an iron bridge, died suddenly. And his death at the age of 54 sparked a mystery about the bridge that still hasn't been solved. Looking at the bridge from here today, there's something quite striking. It doesn't really resemble Pritchard's original design here at all. The changes are clear to see, but whether Pritchard made these before his death or whether Abraham Darby made them during the actual building stage, we don't know. And that's because so few records of the bridge's construction still exist. In fact, the only surviving record is this watercolour, discovered in 1997. Painted by the landscape artist Elias Martin in 1779, it shows how the iron ribs of the arch were supported by a timber frame. To discover some of the other clues concerning the construction, we need to examine probably one of the most obvious pieces of evidence that we've still got, the bridge itself. And with a little bit of help, I can do exactly that. Whilst the construction material used to build the Iron Bridge may have been revolutionary, the construction method certainly wasn't. Workers used the same tried and tested technique with cast iron as they had done for years before with much more traditional materials like wood. And you can see on the bridge here now some evidence of that. We've got a dovetail join right here with a wedge shape that fits in. And all of these have been, have been pegged, look. And then here, on this, on this joint, just here, you've got two flat surfaces coming together at 90 degrees. That is, that's a mortise and tenon joint there. I mean, even if you've done the smallest amount of carpentry, these kind of joints will be very familiar. Now, these days, it'd be very rare to see these kind of joints in, in metalwork. But back then, this is what they knew, this is what they had confidence in, to build a bridge that would be strong and give people confidence that it would stay up. It's brilliant to see it this close. Inspecting this impressive arch much more closely tells me that although it's made of iron and assembled like a timber structure, it was designed as if it were made of stone. Until the iron bridge came along, stone was the main material for making arched bridges. It had been that way for centuries, in fact, some examples dating back to 1300 BC are still standing. It was the Romans who really popularized them, building more than a thousand across Europe and North Africa. Britain got its first one in 1209, and that was the original London Bridge. I've come to the Mono Bridge in Monmouthshire, which still survives from the same period. It's 114 feet long, 24 feet wide, made of solid sandstone with an imposing 36-foot gatehouse. And it remains standing after nearly 750 years because of the strength of its design. An arch is a completely self-supporting structure. It doesn't need mortar or joints to hold it together. I'll demonstrate that just now. <sighs> To build our arch bridge, you first need some solid foundations upon which you build your abutments. Now, these are the supports on each side of the gap that you want to bridge across that will eventually support the arch through the middle. Next, we need to build what's called a centering. Now, this is a, a frame, if you like, that's often built using scaffolding that goes in the middle of our gap here. And we'll use that to build our arch around. There we go, everything's in place. We can start building the arch. Now, to do that, we need these wedge-shaped blocks. They're called vuzoirs. So these are what we use to start building up our arch. And the block that goes into the top that locks it all together is called the keystone. 
in it goes. Now, if I've done that correctly, I should be able to remove the centering in the middle there. Easy does it. <laughs> and there we go, we've got a self-supporting arch. There's no glue, there's no cement or any joints holding that together. That's all staying up on its own. And what's happening here is that the weight of each block is supported by the block immediately next to it, underneath it. The weight of the bridge on top is transferred from the keystone through the archway and into our solid abutments. But that arch is only as strong as the abutments on the side. So what we're going to do, we're going to build up our abutments around the arch. So when I push down on top of my bridge now, on top of the arch, with some force, I am pushing down quite hard on that. From that weight that I'm pushing down through the arch into the abutments, there's a force acting the other way from the abutments back up through the arch. So each one of these blocks has two forces acting on it, one from the weight of the bridge, the other from the abutments back up, which means that these blocks, these voussoirs, are being compressed, they're being squashed. Luckily for us, stone as a material is really good at resisting those compression forces. It's good at not being squashed. If I were to remove some of that strength, if I push down on that now, the whole thing comes crashing down. As strong and stable as stone arch bridges are, they do have drawbacks. Stone is heavy and cumbersome which meant constructing wide-span masonry arches was, in practice, extremely difficult. But the Iron Bridge changed all that. You can see from here how the Iron Bridge was designed just like a stone arch bridge. It has abutments that support the arch. The three sets of ribs carry forces through the arch, much like Voussoir. The decorative chain sections even mimic the shape of them. And the slightly inclined deck rests on the joints between the two halves of the arch, creating downward force, much like a keystone. Like stone, cast iron is incredibly strong when compressed, but has that one major advantage over stone, it's much lighter. That means you can build arches with bigger spans, and bigger spans allow for much bigger bridges. This is why this bridge was so revolutionary. It not only ushered in a whole new age of engineering, it inspired one of our greatest engineers, Thomas Telford, and his ideas would change everything. We're giving you the chance to head stateside to visit not one, but two of the world's greatest bridges which feature in the series. You and a friend will head to New York for a three-night stay at Archer Hotel in Manhattan. Whilst there, take a Circle Line cruise sailing under the incredible engineering mammoth, the Brooklyn Bridge. Then jet to San Francisco for a further two nights on the doorstep of the Golden Gate Bridge, staying at Cavallo Point Lodge in Sausalito. A visit is the ultimate way to appreciate these architectural giants. So to enter, text BRIDGE to 65515 or call 0904 16 15 577 or post your name and number to BRIDGE PO Box 7557 Derby DE10 NP. Texts cost £1.50 plus one message at standard network rate. Calls cost £1.50 plus your network access charge. Lines close at midday on the date shown on screen and three working days later for postal entries. For rules, go to channel5.com slash win. The Iron Bridge in Shropshire is the oldest metal bridge in the world. Today it's celebrated as a monument to the Industrial Revolution. And from the very moment it opened, on January the 1st, 1781, it's been regarded as a marvel of engineering. So many people came to see it, a hotel was opened and this whole town began to grow around it. All of the investors, including those who'd been so skeptical of the original designs, made a tidy profit, except one. Abraham Darby III, the man who actually built it, died in 1789. 
aged just 39. That was a mere eight years after his bridge opened, and he was still heavily in debt from its construction. Although Derby had proved that an iron bridge could be built, he'd failed to convince anyone else that they should be built. For over a decade, his bridge here remained one of a kind. But on the 12th of February, 1795, all of that changed. A devastating storm tore through the Severn Gorge. Such was the ferocity of the flooding, all of the bridges along the river were either destroyed or severely damaged, except this one. That event caught the attention of one Thomas Telford, a young engineer and architect who would go on to transform the face of Britain. As surveyor of public works for Shropshire, he was responsible for the county's roads, canals, and bridges. After witnessing how the Iron Bridge survived the terrible storm, he resolved to build more. The first was at Buildwas, a mile and a half upstream from Derby's Bridge. This bridge opened in 1796, had a span 30 feet longer than its predecessor, even though it used only half the amount of iron. Although Buildwas Bridge was demolished in 1906, Telford built a series of other iron structures, many of which remain with us today. The most magnificent is this. The Ponca Aqueduct. This breathtaking waterway suspended in the sky. Built in 1805, this remains the highest navigable aqueduct in the world. Part of the Ellesmere Canal, it took 10 years to construct and cost 47,000 pounds. That's around three and a half million pounds in today's money. The views from up here, they're just stunning. But you can't really see the aqueduct itself. I mean, I can see the shadow out there, but that's about it. It's not enough detail. To really get a good look, you need to be down the bottom. And the quickest way to get there is by going over the side. Good to go. There's something very unnatural about doing this. Just gonna uh, okay. come in a sec. Right, here we go. Oh. Step off the ledge. Come on, do it. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Woohoo! This is a unique perspective to see this aqueduct from. From here, you can see the four iron ribs underneath the trough here. And that's the same on all of the 19 arches along this aqueduct. And it's very, very similar to the iron bridge. It's these cast iron ribs that give this aqueduct and which gives the iron bridge its strength and stability. The cast iron trough comes in at 689 tonnes, and there's the water inside it as well. That adds another one and a half thousand tonnes of weight that this structure has supported. And each of the 18 mighty sandstone piers that support the trough are 126 feet tall, weigh an incredible 960 tonnes, and they're cemented together using mortar made from lime, water, and ox blood. It was the Iron Bridge that inspired Telford to build massive structures out of metal. And his ability to do that and to do this made him one of the greatest engineers of his age. With this aqueduct, Telford demonstrated not only his mastery of engineering, but also his deep understanding of architectural flair. It beautifully captures both 
the modernity of the industrial age, and the magnificence of ancient Rome. And yet, like Ironbridge, this engineering marvel very nearly didn't come about. Traditionally, the way to get boats up and down a valley would be to build a series of locks, like these on the Kennet and Avon Canal. But they're expensive to build, time-consuming to navigate, and require a complicated system of pumps to move the water up and down the valley. Telford's alternative to this was much more elegant, but when he proposed a cast iron aqueduct, people said it couldn't be done. But he knew differently, because he'd already built a prototype. This is the Longdon on Turn aqueduct. It's the world's very first navigable aqueduct to be made entirely from cast iron. Today, it lies abandoned in a field, and not many people know it's here. Built by Telford in 1797, it's just under a fifth of the span of the Pont Casilta aqueduct. But having made it, Telford knew cast iron would work as a construction material for holding water. Now, it's shorter in length, but otherwise, the trough here is virtually identical to the aqueduct at Pont Casilta. And as it's empty, I can get inside it to see exactly how it was built. And this here is a great example to see where Telford has cast each plate to fit really snugly with each other. And then, then they've been bolted together to create a seal. Those seals then were waterproofed using caulking made from wool dipped in boiling sugar and lead. Telford even came up with an ingenious way to inspect the cast iron trough. It has a plug. Just like a bath, it can be easily drained. And every few years, the Pont Casilta aqueduct is emptied for essential maintenance. The last time being in 2009. Like Pritchard and Derby with their iron bridge, Telford proved his doubters wrong. And just like the iron bridge, the Pont Casilta aqueduct here immediately became a huge tourist attraction. In 1805, when it opened, 8,000 people gathered to watch the very first boats go across this engineering masterpiece. Telford went on to become the father of civil engineering. He even had a town named after him. He built hundreds of miles of roads and canals and bridges, the infrastructure the country needed once the Industrial Revolution was fully underway. Today, his portrait hangs in the Institution of Civil Engineers. In 1820, he became its very first president. And behind him, testament to its importance within his industrious career, you can see the Pont Casilti Aqueduct. And his achievements are still celebrated today. How prolific an engineer was Telford? I mean, how many bridges did he build? A staggering number. If you take Telford's Roads and Bridges in the Highlands of Scotland project, that included 1,200 bridges in its own right. 1,200? So there would be several thousand overall throughout uh, the duration of his career. But it's still the formative years of civil engineering as a profession, as a recognised activity. Public works, roads, bridges, canals, they were all emerging and transforming Britain round about this time. But were there any bridge designs from Telford that never did go into construction, that never really got off the ground? Famously, there, there was a, a single-span arch proposal to leap across the River Thames, which still hasn't been achieved today, of right, course. Yeah. The downfall of the project was that for this 600-foot span, you had uh, abutments that were about 60 feet above road level. So you needed a ramp on either side going through some of the highest value property in the city of London, and that was just too much to deliver. Well, we, talk, we talk about cast iron there, again, with, in relation to this bridge, but 
How important was cast iron to the development of civil engineering? Colebrookdale was the first demonstration that here's something really new uh, and with probably no conception at that time just where it would take them. And iron as well was adopted very quickly for warehousing and buildings, steam engines, rapid construction, the Crystal Palace. So once again, we're coming back to the significance of the iron bridge, yeah. not just in the development of, of bridges, but the application of cast iron on a much wider scale. Very much so. And we haven't even mentioned ships. The Iron Bridge came at the dawn of civil engineering, a period of bridge building the likes of which had never been seen before. Throughout the 19th century, hundreds of cast iron bridges were built. But unlike the original, very few of them have stood the test of time. And that's because this revolutionary new building material had a fault, a fault that would reveal itself with tragedy. Remember, there's still the chance to win that trip to the States, giving you the opportunity to admire the Brooklyn Bridge in New York and the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco from the ground up. So to enter, text BRIDGE to 65515 or call 0904 16 15 577 or post your name and phone number to Bridge, P.O. Box 7557, Derby, DE10NP. For rules, go to channel5.com forward slash win. Good luck. Opened in 1781, the Iron Bridge in Shropshire was truly a world first. Constructed entirely from cast iron, it also acted as an advertisement for the immensely strong and versatile metal it was made from. And it was a huge success. Thanks to the engineers it inspired, like Thomas Telford, hundreds of other cast iron bridges were built across Britain over the next century. But although the original still survives here, it has its flaws. This engraving was made shortly after the bridge opened. Even a brief study reveals significant differences to how it looks today. Look particularly at the stonework to the right-hand side. The original solid stone abutment has been replaced by these iron arches. And this is only the most obvious of a whole series of repairs and renovations that have been undertaken on the bridge over the years. But what was causing this damage? This is a very young valley and the sides are slipping gracefully towards the river. Within five years of the bridge being built, there were already cracks appearing in this abutment, enough to really worry them. And by 1824, they put up what we see today, the iron replacements. And they did it in such a way that they could keep half the deck open to traffic. They never closed the bridge during the building. Even doing something as major as that completely well, re-engineering the, yeah. the base of the bridge, the abutments. This is the toll bridge, and the shareholders want their money from the tolls. If you close the bridge, they're not going to get any tolls. So it's all about keeping the bridge open throughout all the works. But that wasn't the end of the story, because the land kept moving, and already in 1845 they had to repair cracks by bolting plates on. Now we're talking about cracks in the iron. In the iron. But it's happened again and again and again, and they've had to put plates on top of plates. We're talking about repairing the repairs. Yes. As time's gone on, yes. there's more and more work being done to just try and keep this bridge up. Now, come 1972, they realised that if they didn't do something seriously quickly about it, the bridge would be crushed. And then they built an underwater concrete strut to hold the two banks apart. It's the full width of the bridge. It's fully reinforced concrete. I'm glad to say some divers went down a couple of years back to check, and it's in good nick. So the, the Iron Bridge is almost 250 years old now. Bridges are normally built for a 100-year life. This is quite incredible. But the movement of the riverbanks was just one of the problems with the Iron Bridge. The very metal from which it was constructed had a fundamental weakness. From the moment the first crack appeared in the ironwork, there was debate about its significance. 
After all, this had been the only bridge to survive the flood of 1795 relatively unscathed. But an event in Scotland would put an end to that debate, a tragic event with devastating consequences. The Tay Railway Bridge in Dundee opened in 1878. Constructed mainly from cast iron, it was, at 10,709 feet, the longest bridge in the world at the time. It was considered such a marvel that Queen Victoria traveled up to Scotland specially just to cross it. Then, on Sunday the 28th of December, 1879, only 19 months after the bridge had opened, disaster struck. That night, a violent storm raged across the Tay, and at 7.31 p.m., just as a passenger train was going across it, the bridge collapsed. At least 74 passengers died when the train plunged into the icy waters. The exact cause of the collapse may never be known, but there was one definite contributory factor, the cast iron pillars that supported the bridge. The disaster brought to light a fundamental flaw in cast iron. Unlike most metals, it will snap when twisted or bent. And that's because cast iron is only 95% pure iron. The other 5% is largely crystallized carbon, otherwise known as graphite. And it's the same stuff as you find here in the core of a pencil. As molten cast iron cools, flakes of graphite riddle the metal, creating points of weakness. As you probably know, you can press straight down on the tip of a pencil quite hard, and it will withstand a fair amount of force. But if I angle it slightly and press again, no surprises, the end snaps off. And it's the flakes of crystallized carbon in cast iron that cause it to fail so catastrophically. The disaster in Scotland led to cast iron being viewed in an entirely new light. The same metal that had helped the iron bridge survive an 18th century storm had contributed to a 19th century catastrophe. As a result, it was abandoned as a bridge construction material. But by the time the flaws in cast iron were understood, another metal had emerged to take its place. What do you get if you remove the graphite from cast iron? Steel. And steel has all the strength of cast iron, but crucially, it has none of the weaknesses. You can twist and bend it. This meant it took over from cast iron as the metal of choice in construction. It's since allowed us to build bridges in forms never previously dreamt possible. The Sydney Harbour Bridge floats its imposing steel arch 1,650 feet across the harbour entrance. The majestic Golden Gate Bridge suspends a 4,200-foot road on row after row of cables. And steel allows the Gateshead Millennium Bridge to rotate like a winking eye to allow ships to pass underneath it. But none of these structures could have been possible if the Iron Bridge hadn't proved to the world that bridges could and should be made out of metal. The importance of this bridge and the region that gave birth to the Industrial Revolution can't be overstated. It's why it was one of the first locations in Britain to be awarded UNESCO World Heritage status. When Abraham Darby III built this bridge, he'd intended it as an advertisement for his ironworks. Today, it attracts hundreds of thousands of visitors from all over the world, generating millions of pounds every year for the local economy. Not only that, it's renowned for paving the way for other iconic bridges dotted around the globe. You know, I think Abraham would be rather pleased. Discover more of the world's greatest bridges new next Friday at 8.
It was a revolution that eventually brought down the Republic. Julius Caesar's leading his army and Bethany Hughes crossing the Rubicon as eight days that made Rome continues new next.